you made it hard for me, Susie, because I can't promise you all are going to have fun. But um, I'll try to make this interesting for you. Um, yeah, so I'm Graham Cassano. I'm an associate professor here in the sociology program in our, um, in our department. And uh, my main field of study is uh, social theory and the sociology of culture, as well as urban sociology. But um, I haven't written on urban sociology before. So my, my first book was on movies, and my second book was on music, and now I'm working on this book about Pontiac. And let me say that, you know, this book is in a sense a long time in coming because I've lived in Pontiac now for 12 years. And, and I, honestly, I've been a little bit reluctant to study the community I live in, but Pontiac is such an amazingly uh, rich and interesting place that it was really hard to resist. But what really happened was um, my life changed radically about almost six years ago now when, uh, as a family, we all went out and got bikes. It was a May, and it was after a really bad winter. You know, I, I, I think you might remember those winters where we had a few days of 20 below uh, weather. They closed the University of Michigan. It was so cold. After that winter was over, I had to get out. And so, uh, and so we got some bikes, and we started biking around Pontiac. And of course, getting to know a city in a car is never really getting to know the city. You might be going to visit people, you might know your directions around, but it's a very different experience on a bicycle to get to know a city, a small city like Pontiac. And um, we were biking around Pontiac, it was a year ago last April, or last May, I think, a year ago last May. We're biking around Pontiac, and um, we came to this area that was kind of fenced off, but kind of not. There were openings in the fence, and um, we, we didn't know really where this, there was a pathway, there's a road leading in there. We didn't know where it led. Kind of a little bit nervous about going in there, but we decided to bike down the pathway. And um, first, we were just encountering trash everywhere. There was, it was on a road, and there was just, dumping everywhere, trash everywhere. Um, but um, as we went down the further in the road, we actually started to come to Crystal Lake. So where we entered, if you look at that map, we ended up there on Gillespie Street. Right? And Crystal Lake is that peninsula, that triangular peninsula that, I mean, uh, the lakeside, the, what we're going to be talking about today, the Lakeside Housing Project, or the former Lakeside Housing Project, was located on that peninsula that sticks out into Crystal Lake. And as I said, two years ago when we first encountered it, um, this is kind of what we saw first, this old sign. But then there was trash everywhere. Um, this was a, uh, a couch and a pile of dead fish. I don't know why there was a pile of dead fish there, but I thought that was very interesting. Um, we found children's toys everywhere and a lot of um a lot of household goods there's a that's a fisher price toilet this is a pile of um personal items books videotapes a big basket so i didn't know what was going on on this property but i could tell that people were dumping things and that um it seemed to me anyways at least on first examination that what was being dumped were the contents of people's homes. So I thought maybe when people were being foreclosed on, the waste from their homes were being dumped on this empty 40-acre lot. So there was trash everywhere, but all around was Crystal Lake. So this is a shot of Crystal Lake. So you can see it's a really pristine, beautiful area. And we, we had to wonder, what's going on here? Is this, why is nobody here? Why do we have lakefront property in Pontiac that's completely empty except for trash? That was a real mystery. Um, and it's a mystery that I wanted to solve. I mean, my first thought was that is this space, you know, we're in Pontiac. Could this space be contaminated with industrial chemicals? Was it contaminated? And so I began to do some research on the space and, and found out that what a lot of people in Pontiac already 
that. That in fact it had been the site of the Crystal Lake Federal Housing Complex. But not only had it been the site of the Crystal Lake Federal Housing Complex, but as I investigated the housing complex, I came to see that indeed the site was contaminated. But it wasn't contaminated with chemicals or carcinogens, at least as far as I know. Instead, this 40-acre pristine lakefront property in Pontiac is contaminated with a kind of symbolic state. And in fact, that's why the housing complex was built there in the beginning. And here I want to I want to uh, first explain to you what I mean by stigma. And uh, here I'm following the work of the social theorist Irving Goffman. And Goffman says that, um, in a sense, stigma is deviation from an accepted norm. At the same time, mere desire to abide by the norm is not enough. For in many cases, the individual has no immediate control over his level of sustaining the norm. It is a question of the individual's condition, not his will. It is a question of conformance, not compliance. Those unable to conform become others or strangers. At the extreme end of the spectrum, stigma represents more than mere deviance. It is a pollution, a violation of the, sac of the sacred, a contagious defilement. That's Goffman. Stigma, then, for Irving Goffman, is an imposed and projected identity that attempts to defile the stigmatized and to shame them. Now, Goffman uses his theory of stigma to dissect forces of power, to understand things like racism, like um, um, uh, homophobia. And yet, for Goffman, he never really recognizes the relationship between his notion of stigma and social space. And it's a later theorist, Luc Waquant, who was a, a work with Pierre Bourdieu, um, who takes Goffman's theory and extends it to argue that, in fact, space has a productive impact upon stigmatized identity. That certain spaces can sustain, reproduce, and often intensify the dominant community's pre-existing prejudices. The lakeside homes produced stigma, I will argue in this paper, because they occupied a space that was already stigmatized. And we'll talk about why and how that happened. And here I want to um, now kind of walk us through the history of this piece of property, this peninsula in Pontiac. And that history begins, the farthest back I found is 1886. In 1886, that peninsula that's now sticking out into Crystal Lake, at that time, it stuck out into what was called Mud Lake. Originally, the original name of Crystal Lake was Mud Lake. And it was a sheep farm owned by um, someone named William Newton. Um, by the 19... 30s, that same piece of property was owned by um, a name familiar to all of you, Matilda Dodge Wilson. And in fact, my friend Mike McGinnis often jokes that um, that piece of property could have been where she built Oakland University. And it certainly could have been. It certainly would have been more convenient for me. <laughs> but when Matilda Dodge Wilson owned that property, it was still largely undeveloped and largely out of sight, except from the city's municipal golf course. By the time the um, lakeside was owned by the Oakland Housing Corporation in the 1940s, it had become the site of wartime housing for mostly black workers. All right. Now, before we get to the subsequent history of the lakeside, I want to talk about real estate more generally, and in particular, the relationship between real estate and white supremacy. As I often tell my students, um, when I started my <coughs> sociological career, I never for one second thought I would be interested in the history of real estate. 
Right? In fact, there's very few things that I could have thought of that would be less interesting to me than the history of real estate. But as my research has developed and I've become um, one of the experts here in racial and ethnic relations, I came to understand that you can't conceptualize inequality in the United States, and especially racial inequality in the United States, without understanding the history of real estate. And for me, that history begins especially um, in the 1920s, as African Americans were coming north during the Great Migration. There emerges this popular trend that um, first emerged in the Midwest, but then overtook much of the rest of the country. And that was to impose what were called restrictive covenants on properties. Now, a covenant is an agreement among neighbors. So these restrictive covenants would usually govern property in an entire neighborhood. And these covenants, you know, some of them um, are fairly obvious, and you probably have these on your property as well, if you own your property or your parents do. For instance, I cannot build a billboard on my front lawn. Right? It says that right in my deed. I can't have like a huge advertisement. I can put up a political ad, but I can't have like a huge advertisement for Nike or something like that on my front yard. Right? That's written into my deed, and it's an agreement among all the neighbors in the neighborhood that nobody will have a billboard in their front yard. Fine. Okay. But these covenants were not just about how the neighborhood looked. They were also about who occupied the neighborhood. And so um, when we first moved to Pontiac, um, the previous owners of our house gave us a copy of the deed. And the deed looks like the deeds that exist in many parts of Pontiac. And you can see it here, this is the deed. And you can see the first indenture. The indenture, however, is subject to the following restriction, which run with the land and be binding upon the parties of the second part and their heirs and assigns. The premises herein described shall not be sold, assigned, leased, or rented to anyone other than a person of the Caucasian race. Right? These restrictive covenants um, covered property in much of Pontiac, much of Detroit, much of Michigan, much of Illinois, much of South Carolina, much of New York State. They spread all over the country with exactly that same language keeping African-Americans out of, quote unquote, white neighborhoods. Right? Now, these restrictive covenants certainly limited African-American access to, um, to property. But limiting African-American access to property did not just have an effect on African Americans and white Americans in the 1920s. In fact, it had generational effects over time. As many of you know, if you talk to your parents and ask them what their largest source of wealth is, they might say their 401k or they might say their house, right, or both. Right? And for many of you, your parents, that's where, if they have any wealth at all, it's in their house. So we understand, vaguely anyways, the relationship between wealth accumulation and property ownership. But I want to put it in more personal terms for you. And here, I want to move us from restrictive covenants to redlining. Now, let me ask you, what was happening in the United States in 1929? What was the most important event of 1929 in the United States? Yes, and say your name again. Uh, Mitchell. Mitchell, yeah. Uh, start. Stock market crash? The stock market crash, absolutely. Which led to what? What was the effect of the stock market crash in 1929? Great Depression. The Great Depression, absolutely. Now, the Great Depression coming in 1929 was just about 12 years after the Russian Revolution, or more particularly, the Soviet Revolution in Russia. And as the US economy and the world economy fell into depression, the U.S. economy, anyways, lost somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of its overall wealth, depending on what contemporary economist tries to calculate that number. It's very variable, but even if it was only 20 percent of national wealth, that's a lot. And there was a real fear among policymakers 
that the um, Great Depression was going to lead to a revolution in the United States. Now, I want to make it absolutely clear, there was not going to be a revolution in the United States. At least, for, that's my judgment as a historian. At that point in history, it was, not, it was not about to happen. The United States was not about to tip over into a Soviet-style communism. But you can understand the fears of policymakers, many of whom come from the upper class and have no living contact with working class people, that they felt working class people were really angry and upset. And so um, Franklin Roosevelt, the Democratic president who came into office during the Great Depression, put together a series of reforms that you've heard of called the New Deal. Right? So we have Social Security today. We have unemployment insurance because of Franklin Roosevelt. As Franklin Roosevelt would often say when his friends said that he was destroying capitalism, he said, no, I am saving capitalism. Right? And he wanted to save it by, um, by giving working class people some support. But he wanted to go further than that. And he wanted working class people to have a stake in America, to feel invested in America. And he and his policymakers decided there's no better way to feel invested in America than to own a home. Home ownership should be available to working class people. And so Roosevelt and the policymakers, they set up what's called the FHA, Federal Housing Authority. And the FHA during the 1930s, 40s, 50s, during much of the 20th century, provided subsidized mortgages to working class people so that working class people could buy homes and the banks were protected because if the working class person defaulted, they would lose their home, but the federal government would pay off the loan. So these were subsidized loans through the federal government um, um, that working class people got in, able, in order to be able to buy their house. And here is where I have to get autobiographical for a second. And I have to get autobiographical because um, I am here today because of the FHA. My grandparents were um, Italian, poor Italian people. My uh, grandfather was born in Italy and fled Italy when Mussolini came to power, or was really driven from Italy when Mussolini came to power. My grandmother was born in the United States, but she was the daughter of an Italian coal miner, so I often like to say, my grandmother was literally a coal miner's daughter, right? Which was certainly true. And, and in fact, I, I, just as a side note, you know, um, you think of an old Italian lady, you might think she has some kind of like thick Italian accent. And my grandmother had a thick accent for sure. She didn't sound Italian, but she sounded like Bill Monroe. She spoke with, a, with an Appalachian drawl, which was really interesting to me. But my, my grandparents migrated from Masontown, Pennsylvania, to Rochester, New York. And in Rochester, my grandmother was able to get a job at Kodak despite being Italian. Now, let me just give you a sidebar here. Um, at the hiring office um, at Kodak, there was a sign posted for all to see saying Italians and Irish need not apply. George Eastman was a nativist. He did not like Italians. He did not like Irish people. And he did not want them working at Kodak. My grandmother, however, was able to get a job at Kodak because her last name was Bryce. Right? When, when her family came over, when her father came over to the United States and got to Ellis Island, they said, Bricioli is not an American name, your name is Bryce. So they changed his name to Bryce. And that was certainly good for my grandmother, got a job at Kodak. So my grandfather was working as a cook in, a, um, in an Italian restaurant. My grandmother was working as a factory worker at the Eastman Kodak Company. And um, they make it through the Depression. They make it through the Second World War. They accumulate not much, but just a little bit. They accumulate a little bit of wealth. Wealth is the wrong way to put it, because they were still struggling working class people. But they were able to um, apply for and receive an FHA loan to buy a house in the country. Now, the country, my grandfather, had this desire that now I, I've heard is common among Italian immigrants, which is he wanted a garden. He wanted a garden. Not for vegetables, just for flowers. He loved flowers. So he wanted a garden. That's why they wanted a house in the country. They got this house in Pittsburgh, New York. Almost as soon as they got that house in 1947, just a couple years after that, Eisenhower um, built the federal highway system. Now, why am I bringing up the federal highway system? Well, because my um, grandparents' house, which 
was valuable to them suddenly became much more valuable. Why? Because what was the country isn't the country anymore. Now it's a suburb. Now it only takes 20 minutes to get from Pittsburgh through the highway to downtown Rochester. So now suddenly, in fact, this property is much more valuable. And all through the 20th century, that property value increased. You know, real estate historians talk about a nearly exponential increase in property values during the course of the 20th century. So if you're like my grandparents and keep their house for 50 years, right, that's a serious amount of wealth that they built up over time. And what did they do with that wealth? Well, they used it, right? When my uh, dad uh, got married, well, first, when my dad wanted to go to college, they took out some money from the equity in their home, sent my dad through college, which was much cheaper then. Um, the equity in their, their house value went up. It was like they didn't even owe any money at all because their house value went up, the equity went up. They were able to take out another equity, home equity loan. This one they used to help my dad with a down payment on his home. So they put my dad through college. They helped him with a down payment on his home. They put three or two of their other five sons through college. So three of their five sons went through college largely because they owned their home. Their sons bought houses largely because my grandparents owned their home. Right? And what I'm trying to get you to see here, and I know you all recognize this, is that there was a generational accumulation of wealth here. Right? Over time, because of that initial FHA investment, my grandparents were able to establish a middle class lifestyle for themselves and for their kids and ultimately for their grandkids. I'm here today because my dad, with his college education, got a good job, was able to put me through college with very little debt. Right? And then when we came to Pontiac, he took out money against his home and he helped us with our down payment on our house. So I am here today very much because of the FHA. So what does all of this have to do with the Lakeside Housing Project in Pontiac, Michigan? Well, as you already, I'm sure, are anticipating, the next part of this argument is, is a much darker part, which is that African Americans were excluded <laughs> from the same processes that generated wealth for my grandparents. Now, here I want to take a step back and say that um, my grandparents worked hard for everything they got. Right? I don't want them for one second take away from their hard work. But what they did not understand, because it was invisible to them, was that they were getting affirmative action from the federal government. And here I'm using affirmative action, meaning helping one racial group over others. And I'm using it in a way that Ira Katz Nelson, the great historian, uses it when he titles his book, When Affirmative Action Was White. And in that book, Ira Katz Nelson goes through, in fact, the 20th century and all the various federal policies that channeled money toward the white community and away from other racial and ethnic groups in the United States. So my grandparents got a hand up from the federal government and had no idea, they knew they were getting some help, but they had no idea that African Americans were excluded from this process. Why this exclusion? Well, let's be straightforward about it, right? The federal government did not want to lose money on these deals and they didn't want the banks to lose money on these deals either. And therefore they raided neighborhoods based on how likely it was that the government and the banks were going to get their money back. They rated them A through D, right? And in fact, the federal government sent surveyors out to every city in the United States and nearly, not all, but nearly every community in the United States, and they made real estate maps. And these real estate maps would grade neighborhoods. And if a neighborhood was graded A, that means it was quite likely the bank would get its money back. And there was a green line drawn around that neighborhood. That neighborhood was fit for investment. However, if um, however, if uh, if the um, neighborhood was considered unfit for investment, 
It was rated D. They would draw a red line around it, and the banks and the FHA would not invest in that neighborhood. This is from Thomas Segrew's wonderful book about Detroit, the origin of the urban crisis. Federal housing policy gave official sanction to discriminatory real estate sales and banking and lending practices. The primary source used by brokers and lenders to determine eligibility for mortgages and home loans were the residential security maps and surveys developed by the Federal Home Loan Bank Board officials in collaboration with local real estate brokers and lenders. The maps carefully subdivided the entire Detroit metropolitan area and all of Pontiac and, in fact, much of the United States into sections ranked A, green, through D, red, based on a survey of the age of buildings, their condition, and the amenities and infrastructures in the neighborhood. Most important in determining a neighborhood's classification was the level of racial, ethnic, and economic homogeneity, the absence or presence of a lower grade population. And that lower grade population here is not just code for working class people. It was code for that. But it's also code for black people. And you can see that because the federal government did not just redline um, poor black neighborhoods. There were rich black neighborhoods in Chicago. There were rich black neighborhoods in New York. There were rich black neighborhoods in Detroit. They were all redlined by the federal government, right? considered unfit for investment. Right? So what's the upshot of this? Right? Well. <laughs> When we think about the wealth gap, and we're not going to go over that now, but when we think about the wealth gap between black Americans and white Americans right now, with um, median wealth for white Americans being about $120,000, and median wealth for black Americans being between seven dollars and $10,000, right? that's a huge gap. Right? Part of the reason that gap exists, at least from my perspective, is because of the history of real estate, the way African Americans were excluded from this process. All right, so policymakers around Roosevelt were not stupid. They understood that, in fact, um, African Americans were not getting equal opportunity in this context. And they wanted to do something about it. They were racial liberals. Right? And so what they did about it was they said, well, if we can't help African Americans buy homes, we can at least make sure there is housing open to them. And therefore, we will fund federal housing complexes that are open to anyone, we being the federal government. And so they built the first housing projects, first in the 1930s. Um, one of the earliest ones was in Detroit. Um, but the war effort kind of put a, uh, the kibosh on building further housing. When the war ended, the Second World War ended, there was a huge hunger for housing. You had all these soldiers coming back and, um, and um, not enough space to house them. That was especially true in Detroit. That was especially true in Pontiac. Any industrial town had a real housing crisis during this period. And so the federal government passed the Taft-Ellinger um, uh, Housing Act, which for the first time uh, nationally funded housing complexes. Right? So there were going to be federally funded housing complexes all over the United States. And one of the first was built in southeastern Michigan. Now first, this is a map of Pontiac from 1960. This is the earliest census map I could get. And what I want to show you is the effect of restrictive covenants and, um, and redlining on the black community. So this is a racial demographic map. And blue in this context represents the white population. Right? And green represents the black population in 1960. So you can see the black population is largely confined to the southwest of Pontiac. All right. This is Crystal Lake in 1940. All right. And you can see, here's the peninsula where the housing complex will be built. This is Crystal Lake, which at that point was still Mud Lake. 
And then between 1941 and 1950, the Crystal Lake property became the site of wartime workers. So you had all these workers coming up from the south. They were bussed up north by General Motors and other auto companies um, because of the war effort. You needed workers to uh, contribute to what was called the arsenal of democracy. That was what Southeast Michigan was called. Detroit especially was known as the arsenal of democracy. But Pontiac was part of that arsenal. And, and workers were needed in the GM factories for wartime work. A lot of them were housed at the downtown hotels. Now, I don't know for sure, I'm still researching this, but I believe, again, I do not know this for a fact yet, but I believe the downtown hotels were probably restricted. That is segregated. I don't know that for sure, I'm still investigating that. But what I do know for sure is that the majority of black workers were taken to the Crystal Lake site, and they were housed in these temporary houses and these trailers. So this is what Crystal Lake looked like in the 1940s. You can see these are, these trailers are where the workers lived. This is um, a map of the same area when you had the wartime workers. These are temporary roads here. And you can see these are the trailers where the workers were housed. Okay, by 1947, um, with the passage of the National Housing Act that I've already mentioned, um, there was a search for housing sites in Pontiac for a federal housing complex. Remember, Pontiac is the center of American industry. It's got this tremendous problem with, um, tremendous problem with housing its workers. So the federal government was eager to assist the city in housing workers. As they sought a site for the housing complex, foremost in the mind of city planners was the idea that, in fact, um, because this, would, this housing complex would be open to black folks, that it needed to be in, quote unquote, a black section of the town. And in fact, in both Detroit and in Pontiac, the housing commission set up to find sites for these public housing complexes. Uh, made, state, made statements saying that they would not change the racial constituency of neighborhoods. In other words, if a neighborhood was already predominantly white, they would make sure it stayed white. If a neighborhood was already predominantly black, they would make sure it stayed black. And so as they sought a site for the, uh, the Crystal Lake housing complex, the lakeside as it would be called, um, they decided to look in southwest Pontiac, and they decided on the Crystal Lake site. And um, I discovered this with the help of Dave Decker from the Oakland County Pioneer and Historical Society. I discovered this appraisal from 1950. And the language in this appraisal is amazing, so I want to take a second with it. So this is an appraisal of the Crystal Lake property. As here and before mentioned, there's an acute shortage of property open to colored people for use and occupancy. All right, the first thing I want to point out is that this document, I don't know for sure, but I would hypothesize, is written by white folks. Why do I hypothesize that? Well, the first reason is because of that language. In 1950, it was already considered, among African Americans, it was already considered um, uh, a racist term to say colored people. Right? At that point, people like Dr. King were talking about Negroes, right? Not colored people. So that's the first, that's the first sign that this is written by white folks. In spite of the removal of legal barriers, they are reluctant to invade unfriendly communities. That's the second sign. They are reluctant to invade. That rhetoric of invasion was prominent in white communities all over Michigan as the open housing movement started and African Americans tried to get access, fair access, to equal housing. The way white communities tended to talk about that, and Thomas DeGru has uh, established this without a doubt, the way white communities tended to talk about that was as an invasion, as an invasion. They are reluctant to locate in remote communities open to them. On the other hand, there are many anxious and able to purchase new and modern homes in new and well-located areas. This will be that sort of community if and when it is properly developed. So the Crystal Lake became the site 
of the first southeastern Michigan um, federally funded housing complex outside of Detroit. And then the federal government said, good, that worked well. We have money for two more housing complexes for you. Now, again, let me impress upon you how vital housing was in Michigan, affordable housing was in Michigan in the 50s. Right? This was a time when there was an acute housing shortage in every major city in Michigan, and especially in industrial cities like Detroit, Flint, and Pine. And the reason I say that is because Pontiac said, no, we don't want any more of your money. <laughs> right? we, that's, think about that. They told the federal government, we don't need your money, you can keep it. Why did they tell the federal government that? Well, after the construction, or really during the construction of the Lakeside Housing Complex, groups of white property owners got together and they got a petition going and that petition argued that in fact um, housing complexes, federally funded housing complexes that were racially integrated were lowering property values in Pontiac and therefore we can't have any more. And so they brought that to the city government and the city government passed a ban on accepting further funds for public housing. You can see this is from a dissertation about this period. While the controversy regarding an acceptable site continued, white citizens began circulating petitions calling for a referendum of the issue of public housing. Faced with this pressure, the commission in 1955 moved to pass Ordinance 1560, which prohibited the construction of public housing in, in Pontiac. At a later time, the ordinance was amended so as to prohibit even commission discussion of public housing construction. So this is the lakeside in 1963. And now I don't know what you, um, what you think of when you think of uh, federally funded housing complexes or housing projects. You might think of uh, a place like Pruitt Igo or Cabrini Green in Chicago. These like 12 story, 15 story, 30 story concrete buildings, right? That's not what the lakeside is. The lakeside um, were uh, townhouses, a couple stories high. Um, and uh, multi-family units tied together, connected to one another. So these were not the way you might tend to think of housing complexes. <clears throat> so now let's come back to this issue of stigma. And here I want to talk about um, why that space continues to be unoccupied. And um, a couple of years ago, I came across this book by Valerie Graves. Now, I don't know Ms. Graves. Um, she's a, uh, uh, an executive, an advertising executive, I believe, who um, has had a lot of success in the wider world, but she came from Pontiac. And she wrote a, a memoir about coming up in Pontiac. And, um, and she explained in that memoir that she was uh, raised in the, at least for some significant part of her life, in the uh, in the lakeside homes, and um, this is what she says about her experience. So she was there almost from the beginning. The earliest date I can find that she lived there was 1955. That's how I. She's kind of, uh, she's a little bit soft about dates. I'm not sure why. I think maybe she doesn't want to give too much away about her age. I'm not positive about that though. Um, but uh, what she does, what she does though, is she gives some context so that I can tell she's probably living there about 1955. So this is only three years after the lakeside is built. So it's in good shape. There are lots of um, lots of people living there. It's uh, full of families. It's full of, um, of uh, uh, African American families, but also um, Mexican families and Italian families. So it's not just a black. Uh, 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 housing site. It's a site for a multi-ethnic, in a sense, multi-ethnic neighborhood. So she says, in those early days, the charming camouflage of new furniture, a clean house, rel reliable meals, and a peaceful environment shield me from a harsher reality. Over time, the realization seeped out of the TV that our family and our neighborhood were somehow lacking. 
and I began to feel deprived, a sensation that would be with me for many years and later be given names like underprivileged and disadvantaged. When I learned that our side of the lake was called Mud Lake, I felt ashamed and wondered why God hadn't put us on the Crystal Lake side. When I noticed that the people on that side of the lake were white, I wonder why God liked them better than us. Right? So that's a really remarkable passage. It's poetic, it's beautiful, captures a lot of um, what W.E.B. W. Du Bois talks about when he talks about double consciousness. Right? Graves recognizes that, in fact, her community is, she talks about it, it's a warm, loving community. She's, in many ways, happy in her home. But she also recognizes, first through the TV, that somehow her neighborhood and her life is considered by the dominant white community less than. Right? She begins to recognize the stigma imposed upon her. And the way I like to think about it is that for Graves, the geography of race written into the city of Pontiac became a kind of mirror through which she began to perceive her young self. As that geography made clear, Crystal Lake belonged to the white community. She lived beside Mud Lake. Of course, Crystal Lake and Mud Lake are the same body of water, but the shift to the older name reveals Graves' sense that she was a part and should somehow feel ashamed despite the love in her home and the sense of community she felt in her neighborhood. So public housing res residents recognize the projections imposed upon them by politicians, the housing industry, and white homeowners. And some blame the decay of public housing infrastructure on the stigma produced by that racism. This is um, a comment from a public housing resident in Baltimore. Well, when I first moved in, it was a country club because you had services. See, everybody wants to say we became a prison or whatever you want to call it because black people moved in. But you see, if they would have given us the same services as I got when I first moved here, this place would still be looking good. But what happened was black people moved in and the services were gone. Now, I don't know to what extent that kind of direct racism that this respondent is talking about um, impacted the history of the lakeside. I imagine it probably had some impact, especially when the rulers, the, the leaders in Pontiac were predominantly white. But what I can say for sure is that deterioration was built right into the symbolic space that these housing complexes occupied. These buildings were planned for decline. From the beginning, they were intentionally built to fail. And that's a really, that's the important point I want to get across here. I'll come back to this slide. So this is from an expert on public housing, Hayes. And he talks about public housing nationally, but what he says nationally was also true of the lakeside. The prevailing view among conservative critics and among many liberals as well was that the quarters provided by the government should be Spartan. Congress paid, placed tight limits on per unit prototype costs, often setting them well below average construction costs for an area. Therefore, these limits often resulted in shoddy construction of such basic elements as doors, windows, plumbing, and heating equipment. Widespread negative perceptions of the poor obscured this problem since tenants themselves were blamed by the public for the co poor condition of their units. Right? So think about this for a second. Right? Construction companies are bidding for that contract. They're trying to put in the lowest bid. The federal government already is insisting that the complex be built under market costs below the cost it would be to build any other piece of property in Pontiac or Detroit or anywhere else. So the contractors skimp, right? 
and they skimp on some of the most visible elements of the housing, right? The doors and windows, right? So if you drive past federally funded housing complexes that still exist in Chicago or in New York, and you see the windows boarded up, and you see the doors boarded up, people still occupying those homes, part of that is because those windows and doors were built to fail. But let's go beyond that and talk about the plumbing and the boilers and the furnaces. They also put less money into plumbing and into heating in these housing complexes. Now, I don't know how many of you own a home. You seem like a young bunch, but I'll tell you as a homeowner, if our furnace goes out, that's a huge chunk of change for us. Right? We're gonna have to spend a lot of money to put in a new furnace. And we're just one house, right? If you have a furnace that's heating several homes, four homes, or six homes, if that furnace goes out, it's gonna cost a lot of money to fix it. Well, here's the rub. <laughs> Until 1968, it was the law in the United States that um, all repairs in a federally funded housing complex had to be paid for through the rents. And not only that, that's bad enough, right? But not only that, the housing complex could not keep a surplus. If there was a surplus, if they had more money than they needed, they had to send it back to the federal government to pay down the subsidized loans that they got to build the complex in the first place. Now, what that means is that if you had a huge emergency repair, like burst pipes or a failed boiler, you couldn't fix it. And so what did you do? You just let it sit. Right? And what happens when you let burst pipes sit? Anyone know? They ruin your house. <laughs> they ruin your house. Same thing if you don't repair a boiler and everything is freezing every winter, including all the pipes, and they burst, right? Ruins your house. So these are the ways in which federal policy set up public housing to fail from the beginning. All right, I want to go back now. All right, so now I want to uh, give you a sense of the durability of this stigma. So from 1953, we have a quote from George Isabel, who was the head of the Detroit Housing Commission. Too many public houses try to solve social problems when their real and only interest should be getting people housed. Our housing projects are rapidly becoming correctional and welfare shelters. Right? That was in 1953, just a few years after the first post-war housing complexes were built. So, the idea that what George Isabella is saying is true, I just don't believe it, not for a second. Not for a second. Now, because I'm pretty sure, based on the evidence, that what George Isabel said wasn't true, I can say that it's quite likely that what George Romney said 20 years later wasn't true either. So 20 years later, George Romney, former governor of Michigan, uh, President Nixon's um, housing secretary, who put in uh, a ban on public housing, he said, Public housing units began to fill up with welfare families and many who exhibited antisocial behavior. Gradually, criminal elements, drug addicts, and other problems came to dominate the environments of these units. Right? So I don't want to say for one second that public housing had no problems. It certainly had plenty of problems as people who lived in public housing, including Valerie Graves, are willing to talk about. But those problems were compounded by federal policy and by racist attitudes on the part of policy makers like George Isabel and George Romney. All right. Okay, by the 1980s, the Lakeside infrastructure, 30 years old, was beginning to fall apart for reasons that we just talked about. And 36 buildings in the complex had to be demolished. Um, at that point, as that was happening, the Oakland Press ran an article about what was happening. And I, I grabbed one quotation from the article because I thought it was so powerful. This was a 12-year-old kid, and I won't use his name because I don't know if he still lives in Pontiac or not. But he was 12 years old when this article was written, and he said, 
Because we stay in the projects, they think we're bad kids. So you can see, like Valerie Graves, this, this young boy, could feel the stigma being project, projected and imposed upon him. Now, during the later 80s and early 90s, the lakeside, which as you see is on a peninsula in the southwest of Pontiac and had been <coughs> largely invisible, was becoming more visible. There were luxury homes that were being built across the lake from the lakeside. And this new visibility became a problem. As one former resident put it, the city was not doing their job. They were not keeping up the outside of the lakeside. They just let it run down. Walter Norris, who was the head of the Pontiac Housing Commission during this period, emphasized both the decaying infrastructure and the exterior appearance. And he says, with a casual drive by the buildings, one can see they were dilapidated. Norris also acknowledged the Housing Commission's role in the Lakeside's physical decline. He said, over the years, there's been a significant amount of deferred maintenance. Now, Pontiac's local newspaper in 1995 published a Sunday supplement called the Rental Rundown. And it's interesting to look at it. I, I didn't bring a picture of the opening page. I wish I had. The opening page of the supplement um, shows a piece of rundown uh, public housing in Pontiac. The focus of the feature is the rise of rental property in Pontiac and the consequent stigma associated with it. In the first article, the author compares Pontiac's situation with that of other cities and towns in the majority white Oakland County. An aging housing stock combined with a 51% level of rental property saddles Pontiac with a burden unique in Oakland County. In contrast, rental units count for about 26% of housing countywide, said the author of the article. Now, I mean, that's a funny kind of comparison, right? Why is that a funny comparison? Well, I think you all already know. I mean, Oakland County is very wealthy. And at this point, when this article was written, it was one of the wealthiest counties in the United States. And it's almost all white, except for Pontiac. Pontiac is um, plurality black at this point in 1995. It's not majority black, but it's plurality black. That is, there are more black residents than any other ethnic or racial group. And it's quite poor. Right? And it's quite poor, not because of the identity of who lives there, but because of the decline of the auto industry during this period. But still, instead of looking at the cause of Pontiac's difficulty, which was this rapidly changing political economy in industrial America, local leaders looked at the symptoms and pointed at the symptoms. And so you have another local leader saying, if you drive down the street, you can pick out the rental property from the homeowner property. We're catering to a more transient community than a family community. That's the way Pontiac has gone. And so you see the same thing emerge in Pontiac that emerged in Flint, in Detroit, and indeed all over Michigan and in much of the United States. And that is the rise of the, um, the idea that demolition a blight should replace urban renewal as the watchword for city planners. And in fact, um, the recent book on Flint by um, uh, Andrew Highsmith has a wonderful name taken from a sign on a, a factory outside of Flint, and that is demolition means progress. Right? And that was the attitude that many planners and um, many planners and political leaders in Pontiac had. At the same time, there was the release of, in 1995, of uh, a report on <coughs> severely distressed public housing in the United States. And that report caused Al Gore, the vice president at the time, to call public housing projects monuments of hopelessness. Henry Cisneros, who was the, the HUD secretary, the housing secretary under Bill Clinton, said that public housing projects are as close to the approach to hell as one could find in America. 
The resolving legislation, I'm going to skip through a few, we'll skip these demographic slides because I want to get to this other. Sorry. The resolving legislation was Hope 6. And Hope 6, which you can see was passed in 1992, um, was a housing act that allowed, it shared the same name with previous housing acts, as you can see, it's a 6-1, but it had a, a brand new law in it that none of the previous HOPE acts had. And that was that it allowed for the demolition of low-income housing without the replacement of that housing. Previously, according to federal law, if you demolish federally funded low-income housing, you needed a one-to-one -one unit of replacement. So if you demolish a unit, you needed to replace that unit. With HOPE 6, you no longer needed to replace units you demolished. And so you have the demolition of the lakeside. And between 1999 and 2001, it was a fairly long process. And that demolition displaced 135 residents and left this property empty for 20 years, almost 20 years. It's now been bought by the Hans Group. And um, as far as I know, Mr. Hans, who is a billionaire in um, Detroit, has no plans on developing this property for residential use. So that's the story of the Lakeside Housing Complex in Pontiac. I don't know how well I told it. I hope I told it well. I want to say this is being filmed for Pontiac. So if anyone in Pontiac actually happens to watch this, I want to make it clear. I am just beginning this research. There are people with much more expertise than I have on the Lakeside, including plenty of folks who live there. And I want to talk to you all. So please, uh, if you have experience with the Lakeside, get in touch with me. Now, I want to see if there are any questions in the audience before we be a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions from anyone about any of this? Actually, I have a question. Yes. Um, so I know you kind of skipped through these slides, but the mm -hmm. slides on um, the progress of the Lakeside Housing Complex, mm -hmm. it's really interesting. Yeah, um, let's go back to so I, yeah, I, I, I do different things in this talk, and what I didn't spend a lot of time on were the changing demographics of Pontiac. So I just do want to to get these maps up there for you. I did spend some time making them, so I might as well show them to you. Uh, let's go back, go back, go back. All right, all right. So this is Pontiac in 1970. Once again, the blue represents. Uh, pr predominantly the white community. The green represents the African American community. This is Pontiac in 1980. Pontiac in 1990. 2000. Yeah, when you, when you went through those slides the first time, it was just amazing to see how much it grew just from 1970 to 1980. Yeah. Um, it looked from like the size of the green uh, area that the uh, population almost doubled. Yeah. 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 No, it did. Yeah. It did, absolutely. And not only that, but also you can see the effects of the open housing movement. So that African Americans are increasingly able to live in better, or at least, um, um, you know, uh, more developed neighborhoods. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Other questions? I have a question. Yes, please. Have you ever seen Tell me your name again. Of Matthew. Oh, Matthew. Yeah. Uh, class. Yeah. Do you think there's any? Are there solutions? Oh, absolutely there are solutions, and there are community groups who are doing tremendous things, and I want to point to and give a shout out to um, my friends at MICA6, which is a community group in uh, Pontiac that is working both on helping create affordable, high-quality housing in Pontiac, but also working on um, taking a lot of those lots and turning them into farm space to grow food. Yeah, yeah, they're a really interesting and, and uh, uh, useful organization. Yes? Um, I don't know about in Detroit, but uh, Detroit, I don't know 
that's a problem? Right, yes, I would say that displacement continues to be a problem in Pontiac and, and, the, um, and high quality working class housing is a serious problem in Pontiac. There's not enough high quality working class housing. Um, there's there's good, good middle class housing, but there's not a lot of high quality working class housing um, that, that's affordable to people. So um, yeah, it's a problem. I don't think it's certainly quite different from Detroit, so you don't see gentrification in the same way in Pontiac, at least not yet, luckily. And hopefully never, right? <laughs> hopefully never. Yes, Brett? What was the uh, population of the, that 40 acres when it was fully developed? Oh, I don't have those numbers. I, I can check into that, though. The Housing Commission has those numbers. I don't have those numbers. I, I was hoping you were going to ask the population of Pontiac during that period. Have those numbers. Right. <laughs> but not, not, not at the lakeside. There were over 600 units, though. Right. So, so yeah, uh, yeah. 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 Good. Any others? All right, if you're in my Intro to Sociology class and you haven't signed the sheet, please do. But otherwise, thank you all for attending. Please come take some donuts.